Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're presented with another little horn found in Daniel chapter 8. But now the question is, does the little horn in Daniel chapter 8 represent the same power that it represents in Daniel chapter 7? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Tori St. Cyr. Welcome to The Clear and Present Truth. Now, before we begin today's video, I just want to thank you for taking this journey with me through the prophecies of Daniel. And I just hope and pray that you will learn a lot as you go with me through these prophecies. And I pray that as you journey with me, that everything that you're learning becomes a blessing to you. And I also hope that you like, that you subscribe, and that you share my videos. All right, but now let's find out, does the little horn in Daniel chapter eight represent the same power that the little horn represented in Daniel chapter seven? Before we do that, let's review what we learned in our last prophecy lesson. In our previous study, we learned that the little horn found in Daniel chapter seven represents the papacy. But we also learned that this little horn found in Daniel chapter seven had the characteristics of Imperial Rome. So we learned that the little horn in Daniel chapter seven not only represents the papacy, but it's also inclusive of Imperial Rome or what I call pagan Rome. In a study previous to that, we also must remember that Daniel eight features two beasts. One was a ram with two horns and that beast represented the Medo-Persian empire. And then another beast was a goat with one horn and we recognize that that beast represented the Greek empire. Now, there's a common theme that you must be aware of and I'm gonna cover it in a future study, but the common theme that we must realize is that Daniel 8 is focusing on horns. Now, we must remember, how does the Bible define a horn? The Bible says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, and the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings. Remember we said the horns represents a kingship. What is a kingship? Remember? A kingship represents all the kings that ruled a particular nation or territory. And we recall that the scriptures reveal the identity of the horn on the goat found in verse number 20 when it says, the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. The scriptures then reveal who the horn represents on the goat found in verse number 21 when it says the rough goat is the king of Grisha and the great horn that is between its eyes is the first king. So now we see that these scriptures confirm to us that the two horns on the ram represent the kings of Medo-Persia and the one horn on the goat represents the king Alexander the Great. Now there's two things we need to be aware of here. Number one, we now have confirmation that a horn clearly represents a line of kings. How do we know this? Simply put, the ram's two horns cannot just be the first two kings, Darius and Cyrus. The reason it can't be just Darius and Cyrus is because when Alexander the Great rose up under the goat and destroyed the two horns of the ram, Darius and Cyrus were already dead, yet the two horns were still there. This tells us that the two horns on the ram didn't just represent Darius and Cyrus, it represented all the kings who ruled the Medo-Persian empire. Now, if you're listening closely, you may be wondering, how can I say that Alexander the Great represents the horn of Greece when I clearly said earlier that the horns represents a kingship or a line of kings? Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's what you must understand. Prior to Alexander the Great, the Grecian Empire, or, 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 or what we call uh, 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 the territory that we know as Greece, it consisted of various tribes and, and various city-states, all right? So you had Macedonia, Athens, uh, uh, Sparta, you know, all these places. But what you must understand is these kingdoms were ruled by separate kings. And then under Alexander the Great's father, which was Philip of Macedonia, he began to bring them together, but he never quite finished the job. And so what you must understand is under Alexander the Great, all these territories, Sparta and Macedonia, all these territories came together 
under one king, which was Alexander the Great. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the horn represents Alexander the Great, the first king, as the Bible says. What you also must understand is that when Alexander the Great died, his kingdom divided back up into small in, into these other kingdoms or territories all over again. So really, in reality, the Greek Empire only had one king, which was Alexander the Great. And this confirms to us, ladies and gentlemen, that a horn represents all the kings of a territory. It just so happens Alexander the Great was the only king of the Greek Empire. Now, after Alexander the Great's kingdom divided into four empires, notice what verse number eight says. Therefore, the he goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So here we have four horns divided into four winds. But now here is where the controversy comes into play. Notice what verse number nine says. And out of one of them came forth a little horn. Now the question is, who is them? Did the little horn rise up out of one of the horns? Or did the little horn rise up out of one of the winds? Now, believe it or not, this question has sparked a huge debate within the realm of Bible prophecy students. And at the center of this debate is the question or the suggestion that the little horn in Daniel 8 doesn't represent the same power that the little horn in Daniel chapter 7 represents. And it has been suggested by most Christians, 90, probably 95 percent of Christians. The suggestion is that the little horn in Daniel chapter 8 represents a king by the name of Antiochus or Antiochus Epiphanes. Who is Antiochus Epiphanes? Antiochus Epiphanes was part of the lineage of the Seleucid kings. So if you remember, the Seleucid kings were the kings that began ruling first in the east and then they conquered the north. So Antiochus or Antiochus Epiphanes was one of the kings that ruled the Eastern Empire. He wasn't the first king and he wasn't the last king. He was simply one of those kings. Now, history reveals some troubling details about this king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. History says that Antiochus Epiphanes replaced a Jewish high priest and this replacement of the Jewish high priest resulted in the Jews revolting against Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, I'm skipping a lot of details here, but according to one of the historical records, Antiochus Epiphanes took Jerusalem by storm. He ordered his soldiers to cut down without mercy those whom they met and to slay those who took refuge in their houses. There was a massacre of young and old, a killing of women and children, a slaughter of virgins and infants. In the space of three days, 80,000 were lost, 40,000 meeting a violent death, and the same number being sold into slavery. Antiochus Epiphanes took the Jews through a horrendous persecution. The atrocities that he committed against the Jewish nation is unimaginable. And these atrocities that he committed is one of the reasons that almost every Christian, almost every Bible scholar declares that Antiochus Epiphanes was the little horn. Now, as bad as Antiochus was, and he was bad, ladies and gentlemen, when we look at the evidence that the Bible gives us, it is clear to me that Antiochus Epiphanes could not be, cannot be, the little horn found in Daniel chapter eight. And I'm gonna lay out a few reasons why I believe this is the case. There are many God-fearing believers who declare that when verse nine says, out of one of them came a little horn, they believe that the them represents one of the horns of the divided Greek empire. Therefore, it is determined in their view that the little horn must be part of the Greek Empire. But here we must remember what is our definition of a little horn? We have to stick to our textbook definition of the horn because if we stick to our textbook definition, that would mean we have one kingship coming out of another kingship. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't have one king coming out of another king. 
uh, unless that king is having a baby. And we know men don't have babies. Well, it is 2022. Don't go there. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me very closely. We must understand that the Bible says that the little horn arose up out of one of them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we must understand that Alexander the Great's horns was divided. His horn was divided amongst the four winds of heaven. That's north, south, east, and west. We must understand that the little horn didn't come from another horn. The little horn rose up out of one of the compass directions of the kingdom. Let's look at another point that I wanted to bring out. Notice each horn represents a, its own sovereign kingdom. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, the two um, horns on the ram represented Media, Media and Persia. They were two sovereign nations. Even though they, they came together, they were still, there were still two kings. So the horns represented two separate kingships. Then remember, we had the goat. The goat had one horn. That one horn represented one kingship. That was Alexander the Great, who was the first and last king of the Greek Empire. And then that kingdom split into four individual horns. Those four individual horns were four sovereign nations, four separate nations. We had uh, uh, Macedonia in the west. We had Asia Minor in the north. We had Syria in the east. And we had Egypt in the south. Four different horns, four different kingships. So what is it that the Bible is trying to tell us? Ladies and gentlemen, it's unfortunate that many people believe the little horn is a horn within another horn. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a Greek uh, king, who was a Greek king, rose up as part of the kingship of the Seleucid Empire, now you have two horns in one kingdom. Instead of Daniel 7 having a leopard with four heads, it should have had five heads. Instead of the goat having four horns, four divided horns, it should have had five horns, ladies and gentlemen. But we don't see that. The Bible says that the Greek empire only had four horns. Daniel 7 says the leopard only had four heads. My final point on this is the fact that the little horn is said to wax great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the pleasant land. Now, many believers believe that when Antiochus nearly conquered Egypt, that he was waxing great towards the south. Okay, I can see that. Many believers also say that because Antiochus nearly destroyed Jerusalem, that he was waxing great towards the pleasant land. I can see that as well. But now the question remains, ladies and gentlemen, how does Antiochus Epiphanes wax great towards the east when he was the king of the east already? How does one wax great towards a territory that he is already ruling? It would be like me, ladies and gentlemen, saying that I'm becoming the man of my house. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a father and I'm a husband. I'm already the man of the house. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't need to wax great in my own home. I'm already great in my own home. You know, as a matter of fact, when I tell my wife to jump, my wife asks me, well, how? hold on one second. Two hours ago, and they're gonna be here pretty soon. Oh, babe, I'm. It's gonna cost us money if we miss it. I'm, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. Hurry up and put it up, please. Yes, ma'am. I got it. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Okay, so sorry before we got rudely interrupted there. Like I was saying, when I asked my wife to jump. She asked me how high. That's because I'm already great in my own home. Now, if you do me a favor, ladies and gentlemen, if you can just kind of keep this conversation between me, and, uh, between me and you for just obvious reasons, I would appreciate that. But I digress, ladies and gentlemen. You see, Antiochus cannot wax great towards the east when he's already the king of the east. 
It doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why we must understand is that this little horn in Daniel chapter 8 is the same entity, the same power of the little horn in Daniel chapter 7. And now remember what we said in Daniel chapter 7, because you must understand that the same narrative of Daniel chapter 7 is the exact same narrative of Daniel chapter 8. Remember what did we say? We said there were four kings of the Greek empire, right? We said the Seleucid kingship went and conquered the Lysimachan kings in the north, or Asia Minor kings, right? So now we have the Seleucid kingship, which rules the north and the east. We have the Antigonid dynasty or the Antigonid kingship that ruled the west. And we had the Ptolemaic kingship that ruled the south. Now the empire only had three kings that were ruling the known world. And what happened? The Bible tells us, remember, this is just a review from Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, it said, he shall subdue three kings. Ladies and gentlemen, the Roman empire conquered the three remaining kingships, or as it said, it plucked up three horns. Then remember it transitioned once it went through the conquering career of the Roman Empire, then it quickly transitioned to the career of the Papal Roman Empire. Remember it said he shall speak great words against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints and think to change times and laws. It transitioned quickly to the Papal Roman Empire. Now ladies and gentlemen, we must understand the same exact thing happens here in Daniel chapter 8. Notice Daniel chapter 8 provides us the same narrative as Daniel chapter 7. It begins with the conquering career of the imperial Roman kingship. Notice what verse number 9 says. And out of one of them, the west, came forth a little horn, the imperial Roman kings, which waxed exceeding great towards the south, Egypt, and towards the east, Syria. Here we can see that the same compass points that we saw in Daniel chapter 7 are the same exact compass points that we see here in Daniel chapter 8. Now, just like the scene quickly switched to the career of the papacy in Daniel chapter 7, the same thing happens in Daniel chapter 8. Notice what the Bible says in the very next part of this same verse. And towards the pleasant land. Now, almost every Bible commentator believes that the pleasant land represents Jerusalem. You might ask, well, why do they say that? Well, let me show you why most commentators believe that. If you were to go to Blue Letter Bible and look up Daniel 8 verse 9, if you click the tools button next to the scripture, you'll get the original Greek used to translate the King James to English. Scroll down until you find the word pleasant. Now, in order to get more information about the word pleasant, you'll need to click on the Strong's reference number. So the original word for pleasant is sevi, and this means prominence, splendor, beautiful, glorious. Now let's find out every instance of this word in the book of Daniel. To do this, all we need to do is scroll to where you see results by book. And notice we see that Daniel has four different verses that contain the Greek word sevi. So here we see that the word for splendor and glorious is found in Daniel 8, 9, and it's translated here as pleasant. We also see it in Daniel 11, 16, 11, 42, and 11, 45, but there they are translated as glorious. Now, there's something many of you don't see, and for those of you who do see it, you may not realize the significance of it. I want you to look at all four of these verses, and I want you to look at the word that comes after Sevi. Notice Daniel 8 verse 9 has land. Notice Daniel 11 16 has land. 11 41 has land. And 11 45 has holy mountain. Now there's a key difference here in the Daniel 8 verse 9 reference than all the references in Daniel 11. Can you see the difference with the word that comes after Sevi in Daniel 8 and the with the difference between the words in Daniel chapter 11? Can you see the difference? The Daniel 8, 9 reference, which is land, is the only reference that is italicized. Now, why is this significant? You see, what many are unaware of is that whenever you see an italicized word in the Bible, that means that word was not part of the original manuscript. What are you talking about, Willis? Now, someone's asking the question, what do you mean? How did a word that's not part of the original manuscript become part of our English translation Bible. 
It's simply put, ladies and gentlemen, the translators added the word. Now, this is not such a big deal. This is actually quite common. We call these supplied words. And the reason that we need supplied words is oftentimes when the translators were translating from the Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic, when they were translating it, oftentimes the English wasn't, let me just say, coherent. And so they added certain words to make sort of make the English version of it flow or it would be a little choppy if you understand what I'm saying. And you can just go through in your spare time and look at italicized words and you can see, OK, I could understand why they would add a word here so that the English language flows. Well, the question now is, well, what is the problem with the translators adding land here in Daniel chapter eight, verse nine? The problem is, ladies and gentlemen, that they should not have added that word. This is just my personal opinion, but I believe the translators got to Daniel 8 verse 9 and they asked themselves the question, how is it that something can, can wax great towards splendor? How can something wax great towards glorious? So I believe they looked at the other references of Daniel and found in Daniel chapter 11 and they realized that every time that word save was used in Daniel 11, it represented Jerusalem. And so they logically added the word land here in Daniel chapter 8, thinking that it represented Jerusalem. But ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe that's the message God is trying to give us. Simply because we recognize that the previous world powers, they all wax great towards Jerusalem as well. There's nothing special about Rome waxing great towards Jerusalem. So what is the Bible trying to tell us? I don't believe the word land is applicable. I believe the word should have been left as simply glory or gloriousness. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the papacy waxed great towards the glory of God. In other words, they attempted to conquer or usurp the authority of God. So they waxed great towards God's glory. And we recognize that glory is an attribute of God. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 28 and verse number five. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. Ladies and gentlemen, we now see that glory is an attribute of God. And in this manner, we can see that the papacy was the one that waxed great towards or tried to usurp God's glory. Now, the very next verse tells us how they tried to do this. Notice what the Bible says. It says, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Now, what you must understand is that the host of heaven is a representation of of the New Testament church. You see, according to scripture, spiritually, the saints of God are worshiping in heaven. Notice what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter two, verse six, and he hath raised us up together and made us sit where together? In heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we can see how the host is a representation of the New Testament church. And now we can understand that when the scripture says that the stars were cast out unto the ground and stamped upon, now we can understand that here the Christian church was persecuted by the papacy during the dark ages. And if it's not clear, ladies and gentlemen, that it was the little horn that waxed great towards the glory of God, look at what it says in verse number 11. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Ladies and gentlemen, the prince of the host represents none other than Jesus Christ. Now we're seeing here, it is the papacy, it is the little horn that waxed great, not towards Jerusalem, but the Bible's trying to tell us it waxed great towards the glory, the, the, the prerogatives of God. And thus we see in this manner, ladies and gentlemen, the little horn, of Daniel 8 also represents the same exact power of the little horn in Daniel chapter 7. And that is the Roman Empire. There were two phases, the imperial or pagan phase, and then the papal phase. And so ladies and gentlemen, 
Now we can see who the little horn of Daniel chapter 8 represents. And now we're going to test your knowledge. If a horn represents all the kings who ruled a territory, how can the great horn on the goat only represent Alexander the Great? Ladies and gentlemen, we recognize that Alexander the Great was the first king of the Greek Empire. However, when he died, the empire divided into smaller kingdoms. Therefore, Alexander the Great was the first king, but he was the only king of the Greek Empire. Who does the little horn of Daniel 8 represent? A. Antiochus Epiphanes B. Imperial Rome C. Imperial and Paper Rome Here, we remember that the little horn of Daniel 8 also represents the same exact power of the little horn in Daniel chapter 7. It is not Antiochus Epiphanes, it is Imperial Rome and Papal Rome. The Bible says the little horn came out of one of them. Does them represent the horns or the winds? Ladies and gentlemen, history reveals that the little horn came from the west conquering the Greek Empire. Therefore, we understand that the them in verse number 9 is in reference to the winds and more specifically the western wind. How did the little horn wax great towards the splendor or glory? Because the Bible says he shall magnify himself against the prince of the host. In essence, the little horn tried to take on the prerogatives of God. And we can see this in things where they bow down to images, where instead of confessing their sins to God, they confess their sins to a priest. We also see this when, it, when they thought to change the Sabbath. So we see, ladies and gentlemen, that it clearly was the papacy that moved towards the gloriness or the gloriousness of God. And now our time is up. But I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank you for listening. And now you under And now you understand the clear and present truth of the little horn in Daniel chapter 8. Got to go. Bye.